Okay, so this bit, I'm going to go through reasonably quickly. Um, this first page, just recapping, right? You're going to have static dynamic movement, right? You're going to have methods of measurement, a measurement model, an object model. We're going to have time involved. Now we're coming back to the time. So epoch planning. Now, all these things are differentials. So you can read about it in the study books, a bit more detail. There's a change in, say, the x-coordinate with respect to time, change in the y-coordinate, z-coordinate, and you can have change in a vector. You remember a vector describes something in 3D space, right, with respect to time as well. So they are all those things, and you could add to that to time cubed or time squared where you're talking about a change in acceleration. That's what engineers look to for failure analysis. If a particular vector on a deformation is accelerating, then you get worried, right? Because that becomes then an exponential change. Oops. Oh, it might be handy if we go to the slideshow. Okay, the other thing is that don't forget this, we're used to linear things, it can be non-linear, right? So harmonic, you, harmonic is like a sound wave, right? Up and down can vary. Cyclical, which is more like a sine wave, um, or a modified sine wave, and, and a whole lot of other models, right? If it's cyclical, it can have long or short cycles. Now you would say to some extent, like the, the impact of the drought on a major uh, structure, right? Is a very long cycle. You, you see that? You know, it's a cycle of change, but it's a very long one. Um, Thunder, you know, impact of uh, may heavy rain in a place like Queensland, where you have basically a monsoonal type season. It's yearly, so it's a shorter cycle. In other cases, you'd have a lot shorter cycles. Okay, the one that you should be aware of is atmospherics affect distance measurement and surveying, right? So. During a day, that's what diurnal, I presume you all know what diurnal means, right, affect your measurements. So if you don't take account of them, you will end up with systematic errors. So many, many structures, because of the way the stress load is, are cyclic and non-linear. And we'll cover this again in the high rise, because once you get past about 30 or 40 floors, these dynamic changes become real. Okay. So the epoch, the observation epochs are designed to, the reason you're measuring is partially because you've got a contract and you're getting $1,000 a month to do it, right? But the other sense is that you're actually looking for defamation or you're looking for no defamation, right? And that can happen as well. Uh, many years ago in Papua New Guinea, we had a, a research group that I was involved with measuring for earthquake analysis. And they, it was the first time they were using 38 um, GNSS receivers trying to measure the movement. There's a lot of movement in Papua New Guinea in the mountains, right? It's going up like five centimetres a year. It's moving a lot, right? So they were actually almost to pack up because they said there's no movement. We expected the movement across this rift, right? And as they were packing up, literally at the university I was at, we had a 8.9 earthquake, right? And all hell broke loose in the valley, right? And their movements were there. What they were measuring was they were measuring the plates clashing. So there was no movement until it just went bang. So they were measuring no movement. So sometimes with deformation, you've got to think about that and go, am I looking for no movement? Or is no movement actually a problem? Okay. Now, you should be, after the last assignment, absolutely experts in regression lines and lines of fit. Um, can I recommend that you look at the solution sheet at the back of that question? Uh, most of you used line test a function in Excel. Um, if you're going to use Excel, I, I would recommend you all download the data analysis pack. It's free. Right? It has a lot of statistical functions that are a lot quicker. Like you just take a column and do um, descriptive statistics and it automatically gives you standard deviation of the mean, standard deviation, median, all those sorts of things you know, in a list on another another tab. right? Um, and it's a good one for regression because it gives you those figures without going much further. I also look at that because a lot of you actually had the wrong regression line and it wasn't your fault. Is if you use a graph in Excel, a line graph, you know, like for the tides, right? 
and you know you can see you put a trend line in and you go and you can actually add equation right that equation is actually wrong it's not the equation of that trend line with the real data if you use the scatter diagram just points the equation's correct okay you could be lucky but it, and no one got marked down for that because you weren't to know that but so regression lines and lines of best fit are something you should realize that actually uh, the random nature of a lot of surveying observations means that you are often going to be doing this. Um, I've just rewritten some parts of uh, observational analysis and we've focused on that to try to try to simplify it. Okay, nonlinear models, you'll see even in Excel you can apply a nonlinear non model and some of you tried that for the tides to try to get a hyperbolic model or something to fit it, right? Better than the linear model. Um, can be fitted to the measurement data as well. It's a little bit like pre-analysis. A lot of this stuff we're doing is actually before the surveys, trying to choose the, the epoch intervals. Okay, just ignore the diagrams a bit. This is in the study book. We're just showing the impact. So I don't, even, don't even worry about reading the text too heavily. If you get it in your head, you'll, it'll never leave. It'll be like one of those songs from the 70s, the best songs. So if you take a case A, right, this is in years. So for the first six years, you'll be measuring it, right, a particular vector, say, vector movement in millimetres. Now, you, you can do this actually in lots of software, right? So you can join those lines together and say, what does that mean? You can do like in GIS and put a boundary around it. So we've put a two sigma boundary around the line of best fit. And we saw that all our observations are pretty much fitting into it, right? So no alarms, bells ringing there. Not at that stage. That's a two sigma tolerance, so that's 95%, yeah? Don't say you've got to be 1.96 or I'll just have to fail you. Okay, case B is the year seven OBS comes back in at here, right? And it's within that tolerance band or that two sigma band, so you can actually say to yourself, okay, that's sort of not a surprise. Even though the difference between year six and year seven, if you measured it in terms of millimetres, right, some of the differences are quite large. You've got to have a look at the trend of the data to, go, to say, is it a problem, right? What's your real issue is that it actually is moving in this line. Does that line of best fit match what the engineers expected? If they expected this, then it's actually not deforming at the same rate. If they expected that, then you've got a problem. So I'll just point at that to show, say what I was saying. If that was the expected rate of change, right, then you would say this is actually okay. If the expected rate of change was that, then you start investigating it. As surveyors, the first investigation you would look at is your observations. You don't go to anyone else until you make sure that you're 100% correct. And the last one is that if the actual change around this point and as measured is accelerating, right? In other words, you've got to a failure point. That's what it really points out here then you haven't predicted it. You've just said, oh, we're going to keep on going like this. And we're not. Now, that's not simple to work out. All you can do is go, as you go along, is there some level of expectation that you're staying within the model? If the engineers say that that line that you're showing is way out of what you expected, then you might be the one to advise, well, we have to actually start monitoring it three times a year because you might start to get, might start to suddenly pick up this sudden change. Can you see that? So this is where the thinking comes. It's got nothing to do with how you measure in the field. Okay. Okay, now if you've got a non-linear system, a cyclical system, you can still do the same thing. If you did a best fit in software, R or Excel or SPSS, whatever it is, then the same thing. You know, this is what we're trying to do. You're, you're end of third year. You almost finished the course. You will have to go to the real world one of these days, right? Um, so start thinking about its brain power. 
not total station power that's going to get you. So here, you see with this first one, if you look at the top one, you can see that the data actually fits a cyclical pattern, right? And in within that cyclical pattern, there's also a trend line. Now this is getting a bit like your tide data from assignment one. There's a change with the data as you go along, but there's also a trend line through it. Now when you look at case B, you've got a similar thing, slightly different trend line, but if you happened that you actually, where you measured, just happened to be on the edges rather than the middle, right? You can't tell that because you don't know. You've got to remember in surveying there is no answer. A mean is just an estimation. You never know the truth. You know, everything you do is an estimation. Then it occurs mostly at the top of the cycle. So when you extrapolate that particular thing, you may end up being incorrect. All I want you to get out of that is that you can do things with the data that you should do before you leap into some fancy least squares analysis. Right? And you'll often find that uh, if you're in complex jobs, the best thing is to actually do a scatter plot, put a line through it. Okay, now you haven't done this new material we're producing, but if you had an EDM measurement all day with your total station, right, and you plotted the distance between two prisms, and it went like this, up to one o'clock, the distance change, and started to go down. Right? I know what I'd be thinking. There's a correlation between temperature and distance, right? If you didn't measure the temperature correctly, or you didn't measure it at all, or you presume the instrument was doing it, right? Of course it will change like that as the temperature rose and then tends to drop down in the afternoon. So uh, sometimes a simple diagram just throwing the data into a spreadsheet, right? Because if you actually said, what was the mean distance for the day? The mean distance won't, and actually even the standard deviation of the distance probably will not come up to be anything marvellous. But as soon as you see it on a scatter plot or a similar plot, a line plot even, right? You can start to say, there's something wrong. So like you did with the tide stuff, you could see that the tide, you know, the measure was moving in out of standard deviation. But as you went over the years, there was a progression. Okay, all this equipment you should pretty well be used to, right? So total stations, which are the, you know, either the saviour of surveyors or the bete noir, um, and some of the others that you haven't covered in terms of alignment stuff, and some of the sort of fancy equipment. So GNSS you will have covered well and should fully know the precisions there. The things that you don't know much about, and these are explained a little bit more in the um, monitoring instruments, is uh, tilt sensors. I'm just going to go through them quickly. Uh, a tilt sensor is, it measures actually a tilt, mostly in one, two or three axes, right? Your total station has a tilt sensor. You know, the um, auto correction for your levelling, it is basically a tilt sensor. And actually Leica make a lot of tilt sensors, and so do Nikon. So there's a reason why they're using the same dual axis compensators, right? Extensometers are a little bit of a harder thing to understand, strain meters. Read through the uh, the text in there, right? Uh, they are still used a lot, and they're used for lots of purposes. And the basic ones are still used in lots of places. Put down boreholes, and they've, you know, um, uh, used in mines, you know, particularly underground mines. Piezometer is the same thing. I'd rather just read through it, make sure you understand it. It tends to use the new ones in electrical current to measure. And then accelerometers are used particularly on large structures, let's say with dams, right? But um, if there's a movement, it's uh, actually the acceleron, if you look at your phone, when you turn it from portrait to landscape, there's a tiny, not a good one, a tiny accelerometer in there, right, that picks up the movement. If you go like this with your phone really slowly, do you notice it often won't move? When you go like this, it flicks from landscape to portrait and back to front, right? The reason for that is you've got an accelerometer in there. It picks up the acceleration of the movement and says, you want to do something with it, so we'll go to portrait. I mean, it's not, it's not one of your fancy ones. And there are lots of other sensors. Now, they're listed out in the um, study book enough for you to understand. I would suggest you read it because that's the um, don't look like a fool thing, right? So if you know what a tilt sensor is, an inclinometer, probably the most important, if you know what these other things are, then you will have some knowledge of what goes on outside your immediate realm, right? 
And then when you see next week, um, well, after the break, on high rise where there's a lovely solution to the world's highest building and that was led by a Dutch and an Australian surveyor and the Australian surveyor thought out of left field but had a good understanding of all these other systems so know them now to give you an idea this is the Maroon Dam a very very large um, uh, earth dam in Iran um, just look at the numbers there right 786 inclinometers you know, there's lots of stuff. Um, Microgeodesy, in other words, the geodetic network, one network. <laughs> so this is basically the uh, um, the supply sheet for the dam. Lots of stuff, lots of strain gauges, um, piezometers. I really put that there to show you they actually do use them, right? <clears throat> so that adds to an expense of a large dam particularly. Okay, so this next section which we'll try to get through we're looking at more now the surveying side, the implementation, the operations. So we're going to go through the, some of them fairly quickly because you should have had a better understanding of the stuff you've already done in the course, the external control net establishment. All right, now, we're talking about mostly total stations or distance measurement and angle measurement at this stage. We'll come back a little bit on others. Monumentation and targets, probably you know less about. Alignment surveys, you know in, in metrology you actually said Sometimes alignment is the simplest thing to do, right? So this chap in central Queensland who's got all these dams he has to monitor and didn't particularly want to, right? One of the things he does is he set up control with a third point on the dam. He can actually just set up and go sight the far one. The bit on the crest of the dam should be in line. You know, it's not too far. I think it's like 250, 260 metres. So he would notice like a millimetre of movement. So before he does any other fancy operations, the first thing he does, and then he goes, something's moved. Yeah, but often with a dam, remember, that you are lateral. See, some people, actually, someone last year said that, where you should actually sit out four controls, like a square, and have the point on top of the dam, and then you could align it this way and align it that way, right? Great idea, but you've got to remember that one side of the dam is really steep and, and it's a creek, and the other side of the dam is full of water. Now, unless you've got a tripod that's, you know, got legs that are 180 feet long, you know, um, it's very hard to set up in a dam. So it was a good idea, but a bit impractical. So alignment surveys are something that, as a surveyor, you should always think, uh, you will have seen, you'll see in the, um, the building construction and construction surveys, we mentioned that in there, that quite often it's alignment is the critical thing, even assignment one. The alignment of those control points for the saddles and everything for the building were important. Pre-analysis. Now you should pretty well understand that pre-analysis is a fantastic tool for surveyors to use to work out the what-if scenarios. Observations of a single epoch, and it's actually it's virtually underlined here because the single epoch means a session. You go out there and measure something, right? We don't know what the other epoch periods are. You might come back in three months' time. I think uh, Wyvernhoe is every year unless they pick up a problem. So I guess after the floods in 2012, they may have done an immediate um, program, right? You've done this less, but um, you should have done a bit of this in the Comps B. I presume in Comps B you did do adjustments of a network. So you did um, F tests, chi squared tests. So if I asked you to actually write it out now what a chi squared test is, you wouldn't have any problem. You'd be able to just yeah. this like that. I need a table. You need a table. Okay, but do you know what it actually means? Sort of. I'll give you a hint for everybody, the ones at home as well. If you want to understand um, the uh, chi squared and that, is download the manual for StarNet. I know it doesn't look very fancy, right, but the people who wrote StarNet were surveyors and they were once surveying students, right? Um, they actually give a very good explanation of the chi squared test as opposed to the other tests in that manual one of the better explanations that you'll see around. So it's worthwhile if you just have a look at it. It gives you a better understanding of it. Okay, and then you get to a point where the last section is comparing those epochs. So you did it time zero, you did it at time one, right? How do you actually compare those? And I think you're going to assign the question that's similar to this, isn't it? Comparing two lots of measurements for deformation. 
Yeah, no one's looked at assignment two yet. Okay, so it's a similar thing. You, you've got two epochs? Yeah. And then the last thing is like, what are these defamation trends and how do you analyse them? Okay, the first one, the, ex the external control net, and I'm, I'm trying to use lots of examples here, right? They're, we're talking about for measuring. Now, this is one of the areas that, if you read a lot of stuff, people say, well, just, you just put GNSS on it, right? Um, permanently, 24 hours a day. Now, in more recent years, that has become more viable because we have more core stations, static nature of GNSS, but actually, for high precision, this is still more precise than any of the GNSS systems. So more likely you get a combination of things. So you've got to think about the short and long-term stability of pillars. Now, one of the things that if you deal in this field, if you've ever been in real genetic surveys and had to build pillars, is you realise you don't build a pillar and actually start surveying from it. It has to settle as well. So if you're ever with a large structure and you think you're going to be or your firm is going to be the one doing the monitoring, right, start thinking about using some of your control stations as pillars anyway, and give them time to settle. They might not have to worry about the accuracy when you're doing the set out, right? But they should settle. And sometimes you're talking about months. I mean, I think the Corps of Engineers is three to six months. Like, it's no use measuring from a pillar for precision if the pillar is moving, you know? Well, it depends on how you build the base, right? You know, like the physical construction. No, Western Australia, if you look on the net, actually has pillar design for their geodetic surveys. It's different to other states. Yeah, and it depends. Some people go for this, like, big collar, you know, and then are driven in between it. I find with that is if there's surface movement, you know, on the surface of the ground, right, then the big collar thing doesn't work because it provides a bigger resistance of area to move, right? It's a good idea if you want to measure the movements. Um, but generally speaking, if you're doing serious stuff, you try to get down to rock and, you know, there are other techniques, right? Okay, so the geometric characteristics that optimise the precision, right? Now, after you've done assignment one, you've looked at other things. Students tend to go, well, it should be surrounded in a perfect thing, right? Yeah, I'm going to show you that actually nature intervenes, right? This one here, which is a dual dam somewhere in the US, I think, Missouri or something, um, or that's Nevada. Um, you see how they just surrounded it all with control. But there has to be a cost effectiveness of this. I mean, you can't just go to your boss and go, okay, I've worked out if we put 76 pillars in and we observe them every three months doing 14 million observations, we will get the precision. And he would just say, that's fine. I hope you enjoy your next job at the next firm. <laughs> no? So it's got to be realistic, right? Try to always bite for more redundancy. Um, that's a big thing. And it has to be repeatable. So you you not only have to know where you're going to put them, you have to know what the future construction is going to be. Many a surveyor has been embarrassed about designing a net and then suddenly finding out that they put an observation tower in the, um, yeah, in the middle of this here that blocks out two of the lines, you know. So you do have to work in with the engineers and go, hey, what's going to happen in the future? And, of course, you have to make a decision. It's a very important one. Are you actually trying to put the pillars in on ground that you expect no movement at? Or if you have no choice, do you design the net such that you will detect the movement? Can you see there's a difference between those two things? You know, traditionally, the first one happened, right? But, of course, now that you have longer-range equipment, you can go back further. I mean, that's one of the big advantages of the newer equipment is that you're getting that sort of precision over things like hundreds of metres, right? So uh, it's, it's, you can move away from it a bit. Okay, so the idealised thing is there's a control net around typical structure, right? that all stations are on the stable ground. Control surrounds the objects on all sides. This is what you'll see in texts, right? Local control is linked to the FAR control, like the national net, you know, the thing that you know the survey uncertainty of or the national uncertainty of. Able to place additional control if you need to. You know, you can add it in without too many issues. Strong geometry. You can see that's a lovely diagram there. 
strong redundancy, right, which should mean flexibility in redundancy. So the sort of thing is if you have a standard program and you observe a certain number of observations, if you detect movement, then you might go, is it significant or not? I'll go back in a month and I'll re-observe with maybe double the number of observations. Gives you more confidence, a high confidence level, right? And the distance ratios, I will come back to this, to object size are optimised, right? I mean, if you're going to try to measure the deformation on um, a culvert and you set out your control 800 metres away, you probably wouldn't expect good results, right? And of course, this is the, the reality of all this, is this is the ideal case. And I'm sure if you talk to surveyors of any era, They've never met an ideal case. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So that's why you've got to have the flexibility of mind, the flexibility of instrumentation, and the biggest thing is some knowledge. You know, just because you're a student, you have this strange thing. You think all the surveyors out there have done it all, right? This sort of stuff is what you can contribute. Right? That's why understanding is so important for you. The, the least squares, the quality control. It's because a lot of the firms you work for haven't been exposed to these sorts of things and it's becoming more of a quality control world. You can actually be a contributor, not at a junior level. Okay, so some of the complex is back to the Katsi Dam, right? Um, and you can see there on the right-hand side here, this is in the study book, they've got major control, right? Then direct dam control at bottom of dam, the large green circles, and the smaller points are... A tertiary control. So they're almost mimicking a national system, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary control. Uh, obviously, P1, P2, P3.4 would have been put in in such a way that they are very, very confident that it's not going to move, right? Still redundancy, because there's four control points, but that would be the major things. And as they move down, of course, they can be, it, you can take greater risk because you can re-establish the control. Some things uh, are difficult. Things get in the road, right? And I'm just going to show you a couple of complex scenarios because you probably think, you know, I mean, you're going to leave this course and the Oakey Shire Council says, oh, I'm going to employ that you know, new graduate because they're really bright, those graduates, right? And to monitor with this new dam we put in. It's not very big. It's only like 180 metres wide and 12 metres high, right? So you come up with this very fancy control net and everything else and they forgot to tell you that actually everything around the dams moves and it's quagged by and, you know, whatnot. So, complex examples. So here you've got a bridge and a dam, right? Um, where are you going to set up your control stations there? No, the road moves. That's also been done to get dug out or exploded. So your level of confidence in it, um, you will find places to set out. What you would find hard is to get the geometry you want, right? The dam? No, the dam is for targets. Yeah, I'll take targets. Yeah. So when we're talking about the control, you, you, there are places. I mean, you can find places. But you can see the complexity of finding it is not easy, right? Um, and because dams are, these are two dams in the US where it's very traditionally going to very narrow areas, right? That you've actually got to set out like the the Katsi Dam where you went from this larger outside control to working your way down. It's not as simple here because the larger outside area tends to get blocked very quickly from your other control. And also, you know, if you've got control, you've got to be able to get to it. I mean, you can't be saying that, oh, okay, every time I go and occupy C4, I need to rappel out of a helicopter, right? Or hire a very big drone to drop me in there with all the equipment. You know, you've actually got to be able to get there to monitor it. So there are those issues. Some of them become really quite complex, right? Finding a setup there is actually not easy. Even finding a target is not easy, right? So sometimes you'll find, particularly with dams, that if you're involved from the beginning, is that some of these targets are actually put in during the construction of the dam because you're never going to get to them again, which also means you need to think about the material you use. You often find with old dams that you have um, aluminium or an alloy, right? It's going to be there for years. 
Now you might think of the new targets, you know, we'll get a nice plastic target, multicolour, but you know, you it has to be UV protected. It's got, it's got, is it going to be there 20 years time? You know, some real questions there. So some of the other ones, I mean, this is a bridge in uh, China on its opening day. Um, you can see that not only is narrow, there'd be a lot of dynamic movement, right? But it's back towards us. It fans back. So you, your control at the bottom, you would have very steep angles to look up, right? Um, and the further you got away, well, we know the further you get away, the less precise it is. So another difficult one to, to do. Uh, this one's extremely difficult. Um, there's, there's nothing in the middle, right? So you've got to control, in this case, the, probably the pillars by the side, right? Um, would be your main thing. Uh, but also, they, to check for sway, would be in the middle. That's probably an ideal case for real-time, uh, like an RTK system, right? And you'll find that in some of the big bridges. Okay, look, you can have control on a dam or on a bridge, right? But if the reason it's on there to detect movement is it actually becomes a target that you occupy. That's, that's a good thing to think of in your head. So you might go on there and say resect. Not a bad idea for this issue, right? Now, if you're talking about long term, in other words, you're worried about, you know, um, very difficult resecting there and actually work out vertical movement because, you know, you know in resections there's the error analysis because you're, you're reading down to stations, so it's not great, right? Now that you've got the new spreadsheet all sorted out, you could just work it out like that. Um, but if you're talking about dynamic, dynamic movement, resection's pretty difficult. I mean, you've got to read all the angles in the space of a second. You know, possible, right? But not probable. Um, and, of course, tunnels. This is actually typical of, like, a, um, a tunnel, you know. They present specific problems, right? Um, and we will cover, in not in detail, some of these things that you don't have in the external world. So in tunnels, uh, lateral refraction off the walls and off the ceilings is a critical thing. You have uh, very little space because equipment has to move around you, right? And then even if you do something simple, and this is actually Brisbane, right? You know, you put a new building in somewhere in here, where do you get your control from? Other buildings, they move, right? So, you know, and you'll find if you talk to surveyors that do a lot of, you know, buildings in cities, it's one of the major problems is you know, how do you control to start it and how you increase it as it get up. Like you can't use GNSS to start with because sometimes you've got a very narrow window. And yet when the building gets past, say, 15 storeys, you might have an open sky. And then you have one like this. I mean, that's, that would be an interesting job. I think we should send a crew out and just very, very long, right? Very tall. Um, that one is, I did cite them all. Actually, if you, when you read the study book, I presume you are going to read the study book. You know, they did pay me to write it, so it's pretty worthwhile. If you look at that particular one and then there's in the references, I think I actually nominate which ones are which in the references. So it's right at the back. Um, I think that's the viaduct in France. Not sure. But even a, a more simple thing like this is, you know, a, very common now, you know, a clover leaf type curve in a highway, right? These things have to get monitored. And we don't monitor as much here. They monitor them pretty seriously in San Francisco because, you know, they had a series of uh, 5.7 earthquakes right along the San Andreas Fault just recently, right? You know, their roads do fall down. And certainly in Japan, this monitoring is absolutely critical. And then you get a, a, a larger tunnel, right? A lot of work in this, very hard to monitor. You will get more and more surveyors now have experience with this, and um, we don't do a lot of uh, material on tunnels, but tunnels are becoming very, very popular and are going to increase because tunneling has got cheaper. I actually worked on the Melbourne Underground Loop, right? Um, and some of the fancy techniques that I read about they couldn't be applied. There was too much movement, too many things, you know, vehicles and, you know, transporters and things like that coming past that you couldn't set up these fancy networks, right? So we had to develop a, a totally different method, right? 
But they, they just become a difficult environment. If you understand the principles of management, of measurement, I should say, the quality of measurement, right, then you could take something like, I can't tell from that tunnel, but the Melbourne Underground Loop Tunnel, only one survey company got the contract because the others shied away from it because the tunnel's elliptical. So if I draw on here, it's like a, it's not quite a perfect ellipse, it's like that. And there's about 60 shot holes every few metres that holds up the structure and the overhead lines and all this other stuff, right? So these points have to be computed, you'd say, from the centre, but you can't occupy the centre because that's where all the construction's happening. So you have to compute it from any point along the ground here. And a lot of companies just went, oh, it's too complex. And the company I worked with said, well, if we can work it out, we've got the contract. Now, you should be out, I don't expect you to actually do it. Actually, I do expect you to do it. If you can work out in your head how you would go about that and what's the precision in X, Y, Z on each of these points, because they might say with the overhang lines, we've got a, because, um, you know, the power lines come down, uh, uh, the train touches, right? So therefore, there might be, you know, it can be 50 mil because we have, um, you know, bounces that actually can move up and down. On the side here, there might be something else that comes out that actually absolutely critical. So not only do you have to know the X, Y, Z and the standard deviations, you have to understand if you said to someone, oh, well, that's not bad, you know, that's going to be plus or minus six millimetres, right? And they say, well, that's fantastic, you know. But it's, that's only going to be two-thirds of the time. So the other third of the time the trains go through, they're going to hit it because we don't know what the other third is. Now, you should I'd be very clear now that you know why you go to 99% sometimes, why you go to 95% is to get some surety of the information yourself. And that's a fairly long bridge and a pretty hard one to set out. This is actually, from memory, I've been on this. This is northern uh, uh, Holland into Denmark. Crosses a very large um, expanse of water. Never quite worked out how they surveyed it because this is pre-GNSS. I presume that you built a bit and you had to set up and then, you know, it's like a big Travis. So monitoring that, you could see, would be quite difficult without GNSS. Can you understand that? Because where do you actually, <laughs> where, where else can you set up to actually look at it? Okay, so I just want to quickly get on to monumentation. It should be both permanent on and off the structure, stability over short and long term. Short term means let it settle, right, and its structure. And they are expensive to build. Strategies for actually knowing it. In other words, you can't say, I've built a fantastic monument, great pillar, it's never going to move. You've got to know how you can tell it's moving. Now, some of those things will be from other control. Some will be from actually having offsets. You know, different, so you can actually do a quick check and go, if the offsets, you know, your recovery marks don't match the monument, then you would go to other control stations or other techniques to actually find out what went wrong. Are the offset marks wrong or is your control wrong? Redundancy, redundancy, right? You've got to always have redundant elements. Okay, it, there's a quite a few outlined in the, um, I won't go into the monumentation, it's outlined in the text. Just remember these targets, uh, this is only a small sample, right? It's, it's becoming more and more popular. Often they were made by actually the surveyors themselves, right? And you can do it. You would have seen that uh, that spherical ball. You remember the SME in um, metrology? Yeah, it would be a handy thing and this sort of thing. Uh, you would, I guess you're all aware of mini prisms. They're very popular now with um, surveyors on building sites particularly, right? Flat targets, you know, angle targets. There's lots more available. So some of the more traditional ones is like that one there, which is actually, I have one of these at home that I won for something or other. It got given to me. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> and it's actually made out of brass, and it just looks like a miniature staff with fine etchings on it. It's because you know, the brass doesn't move much in temperature, and it was meant to sit on top and be bolted down and stays there for years, and you just keep on reading it for a change. So that's a relative change. This one here is much the same. That's hanging from a pendulum. That's actually from the Cartsy Dam. So you know those big columns you saw coming in the middle of the dam? They had a pendulum wire hanging down with a, a staff on the end. How do you measure that? Um, if it's moving a lot, it's hard. 
what they're really saying is it's too hard. You can't, you can't physically level up to the thing in the middle they're trying to measure. So let's go back to the object model. An engineer said that stuff shouldn't move, you know, because that's actually connected to the main girder or whatever, right? There's a big bolt there. So you said, well, okay, well, let's hang a pendulum wire from the bolt, right? Um, if we use a stainless steel pre-tested, pre-stressed wire, leave it for a time. We know there's, you can see there's a weight on there. You can see at the top part, there's a weight, right? Then you can say, well, it probably won't stretch anymore, or the stretch should be even. But if it suddenly drops, it's just telling you what's happening above it. So that may well have been above it. The gap that goes through might be tiny, right? It might be just a small inspection hole. That could be the case. And that's why I don't know if I've got a situation here. Well, you can see here, a this is a target, this one, right? An illuminated target. That would often be a bracket to put an instrument on as well. So it, ground marks aren't reliable in a lot of these cases, and you can't set up on the ground. It might be all curved. So sometimes they put bracket. You see this in tunneling. They'll put a bracket out, usually with long shot bolts. They call them explosive bolts. I don't know if you've ever seen these in construction. If you drill a hole and you fire the bolt in, right? And then it actually explodes, and the end explodes out, and has special glues. It doesn't move. Yeah, they're pretty strong, right? Not recommended for the household stuff. So right down to these um, standing prisms. These are ones that you'll probably see in practice, these target ones, right? Um, sometimes they are made cheaply because they're actually made to be put up and just left there. Now, once again, never trust them. So even, like we said, with control, go for redundancy. With targets, particularly go for redundancy because there could be elements that you're never going to pick. Um, you, there's one of these downstairs, a special tri-brack, right? Fourth centering tri-brack. So that's actually a steel, if you look in the middle, that's like a steel um, nodule, right? That the center of the tri-brack goes over so that when you set up, you are repeatedly setting up over exactly the same point. They're, some of those things are old-fashioned. And then you get relatively simple things, right? This is a, a, a vernier, just putting in hilti nails across a crack. And then just measure it. So that doesn't probably need a surveyor. But if you're a surveyor, you should actually volunteer to do all these because you're the one who's going to put all those measurements together and say something's happened. These chaps waiting to get in here. Yeah. Let's just um, go and see what they're doing. I will drink at lunch. Yeah, that's terrible. I just use it for um, bribery. Okay, so like I said, the alignment survey is a, a relatively simple thing. So if you look at that diagram on the right, you know, one of the easiest things you could set up for any structure is an alignment. Now, we've got this on a bridge, uh, on a, um, a dam wall, you know, a small dam wall, you'll find that alignment surveys are very often used on bridges. Now, part of the reason is you can use the access both banks. Quite often, you can't get to where the construction of the bridge is, and if someone's going to say to you, is that correct? You might not even get a prism in there, right? But if you can get an alignment, someone, you know, I call, they call them a dog man in those days, you know, that hangs off the end of a hook on a crane, right? You know, you can get in there and actually measure off an alignment that will give you one measure of precision. So don't throw alignment out the window, right? And, and remember, levelling is basically a horizontal alignment. Um, and nowadays, uh, laser beam um, projections are uh, better. You know, there's less divergence in the beam, so you can use that quite often. A uh, bit hard in bright sunlight still. And if it's vertical, you can use things like laser plummets, inclinometers. We'll go over that more in the high-rise building, right? And plumb line is not the fruit, it's actually got a space to have a B on the end of it. And horizontal alignment is precise levelling, direct trig heighting, which has been basically thrown out of most courses, but now that total stations have got far more precise, right, trig heighting has come back in because you can measure the distance and the vertical angle quite accurately, quite um, quite relevant. And vertical taping, you know, when we looked at the Katsi Dam, um, probably in my era, that was the biggest thing, was to actually hang a surveyor's tape, you would have seen the very thin surveyor's tape, down through fine points, but you have to work out how much it stretches, but you have formula for all those sorts of things, right? So, still possible. Um, you'll still see invar tapes used on 
some structures by surveyors. Okay, one of the problems with alignment is you've got to be able to see it. So, you know, anything that's in the, um, in the road, it's just going to kill the whole alignment exercise. So if you're predetermining where this stuff goes, you've got to work out where guardrails are going to be, where other things are going to be in the future. Okay, and then precise alignment, some of the stuff we discussed in um, the large-scale metrology, uh, can be used as well. Okay, you should have covered refraction. You don't cover it much in the course, I think a little bit in 2301. Is there anywhere else you did refraction? That you can remember? I don't remember. It's, anyway, it's um, because I have an interest in it anyway, but I mean, aside from that, it never used to be as big an issue because they, the errors due to refraction are quite small. And in those days, the angles and distances you measured weren't that precise. So you could almost ignore a lot of the refraction things, right? And also, we tend to work in open air stuff. So, um, you know, long distances refraction was an issue. But it's basically bending the, the gradient of the line of sight. And one of the problems is you don't see it. You don't know it's happening. So when you go out here, because you know, I know you... Every day you go out and meditate as the sun goes down. Is that right? When you see the sun going over the horizon, right, you realise the sun has already set when you're still looking at it. And coincidentally, it's only by luck, is that the amount that's below the horizon is about the diameter of the sun. So when you see the sun touching the horizon, it is already completely set. Now, you think about that when you're looking through a total station or with a laser beam, right? You will not see that actually bend. You don't know it's bending, but it is. So it's not something you can tell just by observation. Very difficult to model. All you can do is to try to avoid it, right? One of the things is just avoid going close to buildings, structures, walls, particularly hot machinery. Very hard in a tunnel if you've got a digger, you know, or on a construction site. You know, you could bend uh, over metres, you could bend centimetres by the exhaust out of the back of a, a diesel motor, right? So one of the things is just to avoid it. The standard thing used to be 0.5 metre above the ground, right? I would even go, even that is dangerous, right? There's some research we've done that shows even a 0.5 a metre is a problem. Take observations at different times because it's temperature related, temperature gradient related, then it makes a difference the time of the day. Okay, pre-analysis we've gone through, you know what you're going to do. What you probably haven't done so far is the mix of GNSS, right? Um, you see StarNet and those programs can do it. It's not complex. Once again, it's a matter of getting the correct model for the uncertainties in the GNSS and putting out the observations, right, in the, in the correct order at how many you have. Okay. So I won't go through every detail here, but when you're doing a pre-analysis, basically you go through some fairly clear stages you should be aware of, right? So you fix the coordinates of the main control. Even if you don't know them exactly, you fix them. A lot of students didn't quite realise what that thing is, you know, you put down exact coordinates and things like that. When you do pre-analysis, it's just, you can scale the coordinates of a map, you know, it'd be close enough, right? So you use approximate coordinates, you determine the standard deviations of the observations, right? That can come from your equipment, um, and then you, you should be adding in. Don't forget, what we did there is very small. You you put in standard deviation of the uh, the bearing. Remember that? Standard deviation of the distance. What about the impact of temperature change on the distance? Pressure change. You know? Refraction. You can end up with a lot of errors, right? So you put in what you do know. And centering is one of the ones that you always should put in because it has an impact on both angles and distances, right? Okay, so you, you look at that like you've already done, you analyse it. Stage B is, for this particular thing, is given the pre-analysis, right, where do you put the targets? Now, with some of your structures, you actually have flexibility. I mean, if you were doing an analysis of this wall, for example, and you and the wall's on my right, and then on my left, you actually decide to put a control station. Well, the far thing from the wall, you go, that's not going to be as good. 
but I can't move the control station. So you think about this. So we've got this long wall at right angles. I'll try to draw it here if I can a little bit. So that's the target wall, right? That's the only place you can put the control station it's down here. So these ones you're measuring here, not bad, close, right? And you're worried about out here because you want to keep the precision. There's no use knowing this end of the wall to a certain precision and not knowing that one. Now, can you see what you could do here? You might have two targets here. If you put four targets up there, you see you increase your redundancy? So in this area, you might decide to, this is a very simple case, but always think with pre-analysis, you can play these games of, okay, if I can only measure from a certain point, how do I keep my precision of where I measure the targets to, where the targets exist? Okay, when you do pre-analysis, you need to have an approximate coordinates of the targets, right? Determine the standard deviation, because these may not be the same as you had originally. And double distances, um, we had some students say that that would never work because they always measure in robotic mode. And the face left and face right is already cancelled out because it automatically calculates the col col collimation. And I say that's fantastic with the equipment, but do you trust it? You know? You know, with this sort of work, I would trust it for setting out, you know, roadworks in moving a bit of dirt from here A to B, but would you do it for repeatable work like this? No, you wouldn't. Okay, include the uncertainties in the control stations because they're always going to be there. And then you analyse the standard. So you did what you've done in assignment one a little bit more fancy, right? But one thing you should have learned from assignment one, question one, was how to think through the problem, right? What are the real issues? And then the last stage is you go for the stage B results like you did before, against the predicted deformation values. That's the difference now, is that you've actually got from your object model that we expect to say maybe it'll subside by 12 millimetres. Maybe it'll shift downstream by 7 millimetres, right? Well, if it's going to shift down, downstream by 7 millimetres, and you want to know that, if your pre-analysis says I can only do that to plus or minus 20 millimetres, it doesn't really help you, does it? You know, you can start doing statistical analysis to say that if you've got a standard deviation of 20 millimetres, right, can you over time detect a 7 millimetre change? You might, but it might take too long. Whereas if you said I can measure and do that to plus or minus 3 millimetres, then you can see that you're, you're within the range at about 95% 90, of the expected deformation. So you can you look at that and you run around and see if a particular control station has an issue, right? Now, if one particular control station has an issue, you should have learned from assignment one that you know, everyone applied it as so though everywhere you set up, you did the same. With monitoring, you don't have to. Like, there might be one far control station. It's the only place you can put a control station. You remember some of those scenarios with the steep cliffs? Maybe there's one point that juts out. Well, there's no reason there when you occupy that point that you don't take more observations. It's less certain, right? You know, and you may not need the more observations. Now, that pre-analysis allows you to play with all these things. Okay, so this is a typical example. Very simple dam. You've got four targets, right? The four control stations and the external. So this is extremely basic, right? But probably quite correct in that you may have you may have wished to put some control up here, but you can see you're starting to block lines of sight. Very difficult to see. And of course this is all water, so you can't do much about that. And it's quite a big dam. So it's about 800, 800 metres across, 43 metres high. And we've got the target points there. Now, don't read every one of these. I want you to think about the things you should have been thinking about in the assignment. Total station, you have horizontal and vertical uncertainties, right? In distance, you have a, a fixed and a scale uncertainty. Precise levelling, you have an uncertainty level. Pillared stations, you know, like a standard pillar station, people talk about a quarter of a millimetre of uncertainty. It's about right. Uncertainty in the temperature along the line. And it's uncertainty in the pressure along the line. Now, do you notice I say along the line there? So it's not just the fact that you pull out a you know, plumb bomb that your mother gave you for your fifth birthday, you know, or a, a thermometer, and think, oh, that'll do, right? And hang it near the instrument. 
is that what you're really measuring with your EDM is that line. So it's the uncertainty in that line as you go through. Can you all see that? And sometimes, if you're doing it out here, when you do the um, uh, EDM calibration in prac, whatever you're doing it, right, you can actually walk along the line and measure the temperature and pressure and then take a mean. One of the things about deformation, particularly for dams and bridges, right, is that you realise that you can't walk along the line. Now, there are some new possibilities for that, not any that I'm aware and has put into place, and hopefully we will get maybe a student fourth year project next year if you're looking for something interesting. You fly the line with a drone with the new, I've got um, I've got a sample one, it's, it's that big, has a USB sticking out the end, measures temperature to 0.1 of a degree, pressure to 0.25 of a millibar, right? Every, whatever time you want. Every 0.1 of a second. Now if you really want to know what the conditions are on the line, you could actually, because they're like two or three hundred dollars each, these things to buy, you know, if you had a few of them, you could actually walk the line, have them out, or these days, cheap drone, fly the line you're actually measuring. Now, think about the scenario, right? A dam. You, what option do you have between two sides of a gorge to measure what the temperature is in the middle? Unless you've got a trained pigeon or something similar, right? Or you're a very good parachutist. You know, you are actually measuring each end, and and yet you know that the temperature middle probably is different because you're on one side inside the rock or forest, right? And the other side might be the same, but in the middle you've got a river down below you. You've got to presume the temperature coming up from there is different to the temperature you're measuring, right? So always with temperature, be a little, you know, when you put it into your equation, be a little bit more careful about it. And pressure is the other thing. And of course, pressure is related to height, so it's the difference in pressure you're measuring. The prism constant, you know, you do that normally with the calibration of an instrument. So a prism constant is you should be, you should know which prisms you're using. And actually, if you're doing, I don't know currently, but I don't know before, is that when they were using, always using EDMs on uh, dam calibrations, those prisms were bought with a single purpose. So that prism is matched to that instrument and always used with it. So there's a reason for that. And of course, with the newer equipment you have to bring in, which not, doesn't happen very often, is the prism centering, the ATR, the automatic target recognition. Most students haven't been made properly aware of this. There is a reasonably large um, level of, stand, of random error in that. Plus your height of instruments, height of targets, all those other things. So there's a lot of things that you have to consider if you're really going to do it properly. Okay. In the in the text, I give you an example of a you know fairly precise EDM 0.75 plus 1.25 part per million. That's pretty good, right? And other things, and we go through a, an example there. Okay, forget the example; you can do that yourself. The key thing is the objectives of actually doing it is that inside your net, right? Does it meet? And this is a broad rule of thumb, and you'll see this in the next lecture as well is that generally speaking, and this comes from a European's perspective, if engineers are talking about precisions, and surveyors do that there, if you have got to have the height on the fourth floor better than five millimetres, right, then surveyors tend to say that whatever you put in has to be three to four times better than the construction capabilities. Now, we're, and here I'm saying it has to be better than the deformation. So if they're looking for a 5 millimeter or 10 millimeter definition you know, of deformation, trying to find out if it actually works to that level, you need to be putting control and targets and measurement techniques, your field operations to three to four times better than that. So a couple of millimeters, right? And most surveyors have a problem with this. I really want you to think about that. They actually go, the engineer says, oh, the tolerance is 10 millimeters. And we don't know if that's 95% or 67% or 33% or a number he came off his head, you know. Um, you need to try to verify that. But a lot of surveyors say, oh, I can do that because, you know, the instrument I've got, it's, you know, three millimetres and three parts per million. You know, and they don't take account all those things in the previous slides, right? And they critically don't take account of you've got to be that three to four times better, at least twice as good as the requirement of the criteria or the specification. So that's one thing when you do your pre-analysis. Okay, the second thing is, can you recover that control net? 
We're talking about long-term monitoring. Can you actually come back to it, right? And maintain the integrity of it. Anything. I mean, you know, you're not going to know a cement truck runs off the road and runs straight over the pillar. And if you're the surveyor beside it, maybe straight over you, right? The reality is it's cheaper to replace a surveyor than it is to replace the pillar. So probably not too worried. Have a good funeral. Say some nice things, right? But aside from that, just bye-bye, you know, and go and advertise for another one. Get a junior this time, right? You know, but you've got to have that integrity. Now, you, you never have that. You never know it. So don't actually kid yourself you're going to know it. You do the best you can with monumentation, and can, but redundancy. In other words, have a method of going, something's moved, right? Now, you might not know what, but you at least have a flag. Okay, so just quickly the same scenario. You run a normal pre-analysis. Of course, in this case, I'm doing it in 3D, right? We're interested in the third dimension as well. The things that you're used to, looking at... Um, I, most students knew this, that when in Starnet, that that's 68%. Right. What a lot of students didn't know, I don't know if it's actually, so let's go past. Um, when you have, do you know when it had the distances? I don't think I actually have it on here. No. Uh, the distances, you know when you have to compare the distances and the azimuths? And a lot of you made a comment like the azimuth came out at 12 seconds and you were looking for 6 seconds. Remember the precision of the angle? And you said, oh, well, the angles aren't as good, right? And, but a lot of you said, oh, actually, neither of the distances because it's got 3.1 millimetres and had 26 parts per million. It's a bit unfortunate, but actually in Starnet, what they meant is it's 3.1 millimetres or 23 parts per million. So if you'd multiplied the distance as 23 parts per million, you would have got 3.1 millimetres. And it comes from, it's not old-fashioned, it comes from a thing of saying, if 26, I think I explained it in the solution sheet, if you have a look in there, um, it's like saying I get a 1 in 35,000 precision. It's just unfortunate you were used to using parts per million. Something, no one lost about marks over it or anything like that, but just remember, insert whenever you use software, make sure you fully understand. I don't, this should actually have, uh, we actually told them once, a bracket up here of 68%. I don't know why they don't have it. Yeah, like, if, you shouldn't have to guess. Okay, so what you do is you've seen this. This is not new to you. You can do a number of passes. You can change the parameters, right? And until the uncertainty is that you could actually either hold all the control fixed. You may want to do that, right? But you have, you have to have a lot of confidence in the control in the future, the stability of it, or one or two stations fixed. So a lot of this is actually judgment. I mean, if you had a station that's actually been bored down to and bolted to bedrock, you know, you might have far more confidence in that station, uh, the stability of that station. Okay, so there's, like I said, there's the analysis of it right through. Um, we've done this in the book, and I shall let you go through that case. It's better to go through it in the book and make sure you understand it. I don't think you'll have a problem after having done the assignment, right? Okay, so we know what the what the aim of the pre-analysis is, is to know where we stand before we even do anything. The advantage of pre-analysis, you see you could do this before you even build the monuments, before you even, the dam's finished or the bridge is finished. You can start looking at these sorts of points, right? It is a testing procedure, it's not finite. You know, there's no one solution fits all. And it can give you options. I mean, let's say you've got an option of putting a, a difficult to access control station on the edge of a cliff, right? And another one that's a bit further away but actually has a trail that goes to it. You know, you don't want to base the option on, oh, it's easy to get there, I don't like climbing cliffs. You want to base it on, you know, something you can go back to the engineer and the best thing with engineers is to give them a whole lot of statistical numbers. Yeah, it, it works well. I'm confused. They get paid a lot. <laughs> okay, um, when you're doing a single epoch thing, there's some really simple things to follow. This is also on the notes, but I don't know why. This first one is one of the most obvious, is that you must be able to identify all the equipment. Because when you go back to the office and do its analysis and check it, you need to be able to go, oh, did I use the wrong prism? Or has the 
um, the index here of that prism changed, right? Now you've got to know which prism you're talking about. So a simple thing like just identifying it, a visual check of all the control stations and the targets. It's almost like a, a standard thing. Distances and elevations, right? At each station, you, you're just cross-checking everything. Predetermined plan of observations. You don't just turn up there, right? You And you should repeat that plan. Because remember, one thing about systematic errors, if you're comparing something, if you do it at the same time, let's say you do have a real temperature issue in the gorge, right? But if you follow the plan, the start of the 10 o'clock in the morning and finish at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if you were systematically out by a certain amount, when you compare Epoch 1 to Epoch 2, you can compare the two in most cases. So you're reducing the, the impact of systematic error. Okay. I know this sounds silly to tell me what corrections are pre-entered in the system. Probably the biggest mistake with total station use is people, you could actually ask surveyors, like, what have you entered in there? So it's not only the pre-entered use, it's actually also the double use. So you'll see people that don't even know that they're taking a refraction into account because it's the box is ticked. I mean, it doesn't flash up and say, oh, you got refraction, woo, 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 you know? Um, and then they download the software to say uh, Magnet Office or what's the like a one? Um, like a Captivate. Captivate. Captivate, is it? Oh, okay. So I thought it was called something like um, like a station or something. All oh, right, doesn't matter. But anyway, so you go to the software, and you may not know in the software that it also actually is taking account for refraction. Then what means you actually got double error. So you're making it worse, right? Um, so that's why you'll often find with monitoring and precise work, people tend to use raw data. So even to the point, in some cases, they don't even have you know, automated face left and face right correction. They take off the collimation. You know, they take the readings as read, right? Okay, I know it seems silly, but it's a surveying thing is that um, temperature plays a big part with precision. So you've got to shade where you at least the control stations and preferably the targets as well. Okay, and measuring accurately. I mean, you're, you're used to measuring the height of instrument, you know, sort of roughly around the legs, bending the tape, and then saying, "Oh, it's about that." Right. With these things, we're down another level of accuracy. You should find other ways of doing it. Now, some of the new equipment has um, helps you with that, right? And some actually measures directly using the laser, right? You know. Yeah, because I mean the the new distos are so um, so accurate. Yeah, like 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 it's got one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think a lot of others have a where you can measure. They have a marker, you know, so that they get the right gap. But all it is is you've got to be aware that you can't have any any weak link in the chain affect your precision. And all these things start adding up, right? Okay, check for sites. This is another thing often forgotten. Actually look at the site, right? And look at it through, if you haven't got an instrument there, go and buy yourself a monocular, right? You know, a monocular is like one part of a monocular. I know, it's really odd, right? So two monoculars make one binocular. Yep. Um, and then look and usually get something that matches your... Um, Instrument, you'll find a lot of older surveys used to use them quite often, and it's usually 30 power, something like 8 to 10 by 30, and it's similar to a instrument then. It just helps you look and say, is the line clear, you know, and you're not grazing anything. That's very important from the refraction. You know, if you're, if you're building a road, refraction doesn't come into it as much, right? Try to make, obviously, the observational sets are completed in a reasonable time frame. Now, really, what the key there is is if you can't do it in the reasonable time frame, redesign the way you do it. You know, and that's where actually financially you've got to know the stuff in advance because you don't want to agree to a contract that says, "Oh, we can do that in a day," and you suddenly find you can't get the precision because you need to repeat it morning after morning. Then you got to pay for accommodation and the meal and going to the disco and you know all the other expenses of staying overnight. You know. Which you never used to discuss today. I'm sorry, out of my day. Okay. And sometimes it's just not efficient to take all the observations within one set. Yeah, you know, break it up into into series of sets. 
Okay, this is something you, you you probably learn more from experience than just here, but look at the way, you know, plan, then execute. Okay, check on the collimation at the end of sessions. It can be really quick these days, right? But it is a good hint if something's gone wrong. Yeah, you know, like internally with the equipment, it's not a bad idea, right? Um, and then if you have got robotic, you, you must do that. Don't trust it completely. Okay, this is one of those things you've got to keep in your head. We went through most of this, right? But I want you to see the real life, right? I mean, yeah, you know, surveyors go blank when I say to them, you know, what happens if you measure the temperature incorrectly or the pressure incorrectly, right? And they go, oh, that doesn't happen because you press the button, temperature, pressure, right? I never turn it on. You never turn it on? You say this all the time. No, you're probably right not to because there are inherent faults with it. I mean, how good is their thermometer and pressure gauge, right? I mean, you don't know. You know, it's... it's um, always on degrees. Yeah, and depends on what instruments you use. As I told you last week, Leica has a standard temperature of 12 degrees Celsius, right? Because if you're in Geneva, 12 degrees is a great day. I mean, it's a fantastic day. Go bathing, you know? You know what I mean? And I think, uh, is it... Um, can't tell you for sure, but like Topkin, for example, I think it's like 16 degrees or 18 degrees, right? Um, no, Topkin, actually, Topkin comes under, uh, is it Hexagon Company? There's, there's, there's only a few companies own all these companies now. Like Hexagon owns like it. No, there's, it's, it's a Topkin and Sokia I come under the same company. But they keep separate brands, you know. Topkin used to be, well, you can always just call from the colour. Topkin was always yellow and Socky was green and Leica was a different colour green. Um, and I don't know what, um, what's the ones you've got here? You've got... Uh, Symbols? Yeah. Were well, they yellow, are they? Yeah. Uh, it's very important, the colour, you know. You get better quality from certain colours. Yeah, okay. Colour I want you to actually use your brain here. <laughs> I'm sorry to the people online. The class is playing up, wandering in their thoughts. All I want you to take out of this is what is the change, right? Because you've got to realise if you know what the change is, you can almost do it in your head. So pressure, now you know pressure is related to altitude, right? Fair enough? But most of the pressure here is is actually gone back to the pressure base at Brisbane, right? That's why when you fly a plane, are there any of you pilots? No, you are flying planes, but Well, you've been in planes when flying. When you fly at the Toowoomba, they talk about a thing called a QPH, right? So when you're flying at 35,000 feet, it doesn't matter by being out a little bit, right? I mean, you're not going to run into anything. But when you fly from Brisbane to Toowoomba, the pressure at Brisbane, that's the equivalent pressure in Toowoomba, air pressure, right, it changes because of the height of Toowoomba. So therefore you have this thing called QPH. It's called different things in different countries. So when the pilot gets up here and wants to land, they put in the local equivalent because if they land at a pressure that's at brisbane well they're just going to go dive straight into the concrete right because you know you're a little bit higher up here you know in toowoomba so so that's why the pressure changes but you measure pressure normally with a gauge right of some sort what you've got to know is how well can you measure it so first off i want this is taken out of brisbane in 2015 so this is actually raw meteorological data that I've analysed, right? So it can change in a working day up to four megabar, right? Millibars. The rate of change can be up to 0.8 per hour, and the average is about 0.5, right? And then it tends to be cyclic. So if you actually measured pressure during the day, it's cyclic. Obviously, you know, if there's a big storm coming, like we had, you have a storm here last night or the night before, yeah, where well, the pressure would have dropped, right? But it would still probably follow the cyclic pattern. Now, look at the thing on the top. This is the critical thing. I don't expect you. I expect you to know that it exists. You don't have to memorise it. But roughly a third of a part per million, right, for one millibar change. So if you're out by a millibar, away from the standard, right, it's about a third of a part per million. So let's try to put that in context. So say you're measuring a thousand metres, right? It's about half a millimetre. Less than half a millimetre. Can you see that? Yes? No? Okay. If it can change in a working day up to four millibars, that means it could, if you weren't measuring the pressure correctly, it could change by four, by roughly half, 
you know, one and a half to two millimetres. That's a fair bit if you're trying to go for super precision accuracy, right? The rate of change that I was saying in Brisbane is it could have been up to 0.8 of a millibar per hour, right? That's only a third of a millimetre. But we're talking about trying to get down to the best precision we can. So not as critical, right? Try to keep that in your head if you can. You'll, you'll see it in some texts. Roughly a third of a milli, third part per million per one millibar change. Temperature is the biggest in, impact, right? So it's really one part per million per one degree change. Now that degree change might be that you didn't measure it correctly or you put the wrong standard in. You know, you went with raw data and you put in Topkin standard of 20 degrees Celsius and it should have been 12 degrees Celsius. You're 8 degrees out straight away. So you're 8 parts per million out, you're 8 millimetres per kilometre, you measure a 200 metre line, you're about, what, 1.7. These are millimetres that you can't afford in your era budget. You can't afford to sell them, right? You remember this era budget is something you're trying to keep. So temperature is a big thing. Now, in the, the same Brisbane figures, right, the, the biggest variability is up till 9 o'clock in the morning and then after 3.30 in the afternoon, right? Strangely enough, it's often when surveyors do work on sites because there's less traffic. Now, a lot of the uh, earthwork traffic is stopped and things like that, but from a relative temperature point of view and precision, it's not the best time to do it. So there are increased rates of change. So in this um, 2015 sample, which is over an entire year, right, uh, monthly data, da daily data per month, um, the rate of change can exceed three and a half degrees per hour, so three and a half parts per million per hour, um, and up to 0.5 on a quarterly rate of change. So that's actually, if you've got to do one thing right, get the temperature right. Now don't forget the three parts. Did you measure it correctly? Is the standard correct? And were you measuring the right thing? So if I'm standing here in front of all this massive IT equipment, and I've got the thermometer here, right, and we're actually measuring to the end of the room, for example, you know, then there's going to be an error between this and the path of the laser or the line of sight. So there's a whole lot of factors. Now, all I can say to you is, you know temperature, so therefore make an effort with temperature, right? It's the biggest uh, component of it. If you don't know, how do you work out, a guess is better than nothing. Right? and also to make sure that your standard temperature is correct. It can make a big difference. There's not much use you going on a monitoring exercise measuring a 300 metre line you know, with a thermometer that you're not sure about, and you come back and use a different thermometer, and the temperature actually hasn't moved, but because you're reading it incorrectly, you could be, say, two degrees out. That's not unusual. You know, um, Two degrees, two parts per million. Two millimetres, you're already half a millimetre out over your measurement. And you see how you get half a millimetre and you measured it two months ago, and you're sitting around going, hey, there's half a millimetre, this thing's moving. The only thing moving was your thermometer, right? <laughs> so you've, you try to get as much as you can. Relative humidity for work like um, in uh, metrology and very high precision work and some cases inside the structure, because you can have very high humidities, it tends to be quite small. Um, it could have an impact if you did it, say, just before a storm, but most of it, the Australian side, our relative humidities aren't a big change, right? So that's just try to give you some, uh, the precision of what you should be doing. So you, all the things you have to think about is the precision of the monitoring, how well you represent the line that you're actually measuring over and the change of length due to the path being refracted, right? The path is always longer if it's refracted. Now, normal surveying, a lot of this is not relevant, right? But as soon as you go to repeatable surveying or precision surveying, then you have to think about it. Okay. There's... I'm just going to show you one, right? Obviously, obviously I've mentioned minimising errors uh, in the field. Just check what you actually do, right? I mean, check the equipment. Take pressure reading. You do a whole lot of things, right? But that, that should be reasonably obvious. It's in the study book. You can go through the detail there. This, I just want to point out this system. 
This is a system very often used in the US, in the US Army, and was used in the Australian Survey Corps, which is part of our Defence Force, right? And it's something that you don't see very often. It's outlined in the text, right? All it really is is that when you don't, as a surveyor, you should be a lateral thinker. So when you're not sure about something, can you measure a line that's known? So imagine you're measuring to a target. If you imagine our target situation where you've got a target and a control station that's not too far away, but it's similar. So maybe it's across the valley, across the gorge, right? Now if you measure from your control station to the other control station, you know from your analysis and your adjustments and things that you can actually determine that distance to say better than half a millimetre, right? Or, or better. But when you turn to the target, the target's in similar terrain, right? doesn't necessarily have to be a similar distance, but it passes through a similar path. You can say, well, why don't I measure the control station? And I know the distance is supposed to be 227.5555, right? And I'm actually getting this distance, reduced distance. So it has changed by 0 .00, 0 0.01%, right? Can you see that you could apply that correction to the other line to the target? You don't know what's gone wrong with the temperature and things like that. You don't know what the changes are. But what you're saying is, that's known, so therefore I can apply this everywhere else. It's a little bit like uh, measuring with a tape, uh, a plastic tape that stretches, right? You could measure a few known distances and say, oh, it's stretched by 5%, so every time I measure with it now, I'll take 5% off the measurement. You're starting to improve your precision. It's odd that surveyors don't use this method more often, right? But it is a very valid method to use, and it's outlined in the study book that you can, you, it's called ratioing. It's certainly used in the military for lots of areas, and it's still used in the US as a standard procedure in the Corps of Engineers. So um, it's something you can apply in surveying, not just, you know, for defamation. You know, like if you're on a, a very busy construction site and you think, oh, I got no idea what fractions doing to this line, right? You know, think, well, is it, can I measure a known thing that's on a similar type line? I mean, it may not even be the same direction. If you're measuring across bitumen, very hot bitumen, right? And you think, I've got a control station back there. It's also got to go over bitumen, about the same amount of bitumen. If you've got no other way of working it out, you could actually do that. You could actually go, oh, well, I'll measure the back one and see what it changed and then apply that ratio. Okay, so vertical refraction, I think you should have covered this. Are you comfortable with vertical refraction, knowing what it is? How to apply the correction? You would have done trig heighting in geodetic A or something I think, like that, I think, or somewhere along the line? Okay, that's, what it, that's why you get it. As you can see these layers, the darker red is hotter, so the DT the H here, right, and it's not linear. It might look it, but it's actually close to the ground, it's a lot hotter, and the change. So what you're looking at, what causes the refraction is the change in the temperature. So we have small changes, it changes the ray path. That means your line of sight, but also don't forget, when you have a laser, that laser is the same as the line of sight. You can't see it. It has the same principles as the line of sight, so it is also bent. Forget the equation, you can pick it up anywhere. Right, the one thing you've got to be aware of, if you're using different equipment, is that K, which is the coefficient of refraction, right? Um, unfortunately, all around the world, people use K as being 0.07, and I think the Europeans use it as being 0.14. Same K. So it really meant to fool you, but uh, you have to look in the context and just query it. Um, I think if you use any of the, uh, if you look up the Leica equipment and most of the other equipment, if you look for its um, refraction coefficient, right, you'll find they give you a refraction coefficient. I think in Leica it's 0.13. Um, now, why they give why they give you that coefficient? Uh, I don't really know because the 0.13 coefficient was done by Gauss in 1840 something, right? His determination of the coefficient on the upper altitudes. So that's over over 100 metres above ground level, so not that much refraction, right? And they've kept it all this time. And the reason they do that is because you don't, you can't measure refraction easily. 
So when you put that refraction coefficient in, unless you're measuring from mountaintop to mountaintop, I don't think you should be really worried on a building site or setting out a road or a tunnel or whatever, right? that you should apply it. It has no more validity than guessing. So, but you can see, you apply the previous principle of the ratio, if you didn't know what the refraction was, maybe you can measure a similar control line where you know what it should be. Okay. There's a lot of stuff in the text that's also um, comparing known heights, right? One way of measuring a fraction, if you know the height difference between two points is observe the height difference, apply it to these equations, and you end up with what the refraction coefficient is at that particular instant in time. Now, it varies so much. Um, another good area for a fourth-year student if they want to do it, because it's reasonably easy to do, um, set up to do the testing. So these things here, there's three key things. Don't do that, right? Grazing sites, they call it, you know, close to the ground or both ends close to the ground, right? Don't have something really close to you. You see the bitumen here is bending straight away. And once the ray bends, it doesn't bend back. So once this bend radically, it keeps on going, right? Whereas if that bitumen had been in the middle, it would have been different. Now, if the bitumen is at the end, you can see the change is not as great. So where you've got the option, if there is a problem, try to make the refraction change at the target end. Because most of your line of sight is going to be okay, right, normal. So that's one of the things, to avoid the situation like that. This is listed in the... I won't go through the lateral refraction. Is I want you to be aware of it, but because now that tunnels are becoming so much... Uh, more common, right? And that's where you see more lateral reflection, even though you can see it in building sites by lying down the side of a building or machinery. You know, people even just setting out right angles. They've got to be careful that they're, they're not grazing the sites that way, horizontally as well as vertically. Um, it's very hard thing to check. And some of the major tunnels, I think I cited a study in there in a Spanish tunnel where they tried... Um, try to account for it. Because one of the things you've got to think about tunnels is that you traverse, you don't traverse down the middle. That's where all the equipment goes, and that's where the tunnel bore is. You tend to traverse down the side. Refraction is greatest the closer you are to the wall. Um, they did, they overcame the issue in a different way for the channel tunnel. It was basically by two, two wrongs make a right. They actually traversed both directions and assumed that the refraction on the walls would be the same on either side. And they took the mean. Not a bad way of doing it, but it's very uh, uh, time consuming, right? Okay. Just let's finish that for a fraction. So if you look at the diagrams in the text, you should be able to see. Look at this diagram in particular. The impact of turning an angle. In other words, the impact as you get further away from the wall is less. The biggest problem with refraction is it's not something you can measure. You know, like even temperature, if you only measured it once or twice, you could go back and go, oh, look, maybe I should look at the change of temperature from the Bureau of Meteorology on that day, and I'll interpolate using their figures in between my two figures. You, you've got to guess, but refraction you can't measure. Um, and in leveling, you would have covered that bit. Okay, let's just uh, take a break at that point.